thank you so much for taking time off on a weekday uh, on a Thursday evening uh, to join uh, us for this uh, exciting session uh, with uh, Sanjeev Kaushik, um, uh, the ASX uh, registered stockbroker. Uh, and it's also a great opportunity for us to. Sorry, I'm just recovering. <clears throat> for us to uh learn uh, exciting skills uh, about uh, stock market uh, i know some of you through the various the various groups that you're part of uh, but uh, probably there are a few of you that i might not have crossed paths with so thank you so much for the trust and joining in uh, my name is uh, suchandra i go by the name quote suchandra so briefly uh, i I'm, I'm a I'm a consulting director with an IT company, uh, Indian IT company here based in Sydney. Uh, I also do uh, career running, coaching, hiking, life coaching, parenting, travel, and I do a lot of other things that I share uh, uh, through various groups and forums. Uh, then I'm also an active investor in primarily in the Indian equity market. Uh, I also run a global uh, WhatsApp group in that front. Uh, I'm also gravitating towards a career in. Uh, Startup investments, uh, that's something that I strongly believe the private markets is going to be an exciting space where I can br bring value and, uh, and, and grow myself uh, and also for the global syndicate of investors. Um, uh, how did I get to know about Sanjeev? So Sanjeev is, uh, is somebody who's also part of uh, some of the groups that I run. Uh, he is somebody that I was, um, I was referred to by another active uh, investor. And uh, he suggested uh, that uh, I should reach out to Sanjeev and see how come he's part of this group and is there something that we could explore. Then we, we got chatting and I, I was really fascinated by what Sanjeev does, uh, not, not just from advising on the stock market itself, but he, he's got a whole heap of services that he offers, uh, having a uh, strong IT career uh, previously, but he's been in the market for a longer time and he's also extremely popular on social media. Uh, where probably some of you might know, but I was really astonished that there were a lot of other people uh, who knew him through his uh, regular meetups, uh, and uh, and it's quite a popular name here in Sydney uh, in the meetups. Uh, so that that's uh, something exciting. So these are all some of his channels. Uh, do subscribe to them. Uh, I think he's done a fantastic job of building the network, uh, and is currently advising various people both here in Australia and across the world. Uh, I think it's it's going to be a very very exciting uh, session. So I'm I'm definitely looking forward. I'm, I'm please take your uh, book and pen if you want to make notes or if you are a digital person you want to scribe. Please do it. Don't miss on this great opportunity. Uh, and as I said, it's it's a free session, uh, so you don't get opportunities like this uh, from from the expert uh, very often. So with that, Sanjeev, over to you. Good evening. Hope you're doing well. Good evening, Suchindra. Thanks a lot for the wonderful introduction. And I was uh, smiling because uh, what I was broadcasting is my picture and my introduction. And while showing that, you were introducing yourself. So I found that really funny. And yeah, by the time I ended that broadcast, you started introducing me. So then I again brought back this um, So anyway, very funny note to begin with. Uh, Suchindra, I'm a huge fan. Um, really, you're a legend. What you're doing um, for the community and how you're bringing all the people together, it's, it's really amazing. It's like giving back to the community in such a way that you can make sure that people are connected and Believe me, this is probably the biggest service. If you can connect the right people with those who need them, uh, this is the biggest help you can ever give to people. People usually are resourceful, but it's just that they usually don't know who the best person is in that situation. And this is where you come in. And thanks a lot for helping me spread the word and giving me the opportunity to uh, organize this session. I, I organize these sessions very often, and I really enjoy uh, talking to people, talking about stock markets and um, trading, investing, and anything that fancies them. Uh, the flip side is people talk about it all the time with me. So, so um, I sometimes get bored as well. However, this is the time when we're going to talk about uh, stock markets and stuff. So what I'm going to do is um, uh, I would just start off with the agenda. And the other thing I should quickly do is turn off my camera so that we can focus on the meaty part.
And meanwhile, those of you who are attending, firstly, I am extremely privileged to have you all join in here. Um, it's an honor to speak each one of you. If you have any questions, any comments, feel free to put them on as uh, in the chat. I will be referring to them uh, towards the end of the session, and we can have a discussion on your comments and questions going forward. So the agenda, really very simple. We are going to focus on stock market basics. This is going to be for those who are probably getting exposed to the markets for the first time. And from there onwards, we'll get a little more technical and we'll dive deeper into um, investment approaches, active versus passive investing. So slowly you will see that the uh, level of understanding or the uh, level of, I would say, the technical aspects of stock markets will expand. And we would end with uh, a short brief on trading versus investing as well. I look forward to actually interacting with you all. So feel free to drop in as many messages or comments as you have to. All right, bit of a disclaimer here. Let me just uh, uh, quickly cover what it is that we are not going to talk about today. I am not going to take your personal circumstances into consideration. Because I am an investment advisor, it does give me the liberty to give you uh, general advice. So let's say if you were to ask me, what do you think about so-and-so stock? I can, of course, tell you that. But if you will ask me whether, uh, you know, how, how to do your financial planning or how to do your tax advising and stuff, I won't be able to help you with that. Um, so essentially, I'm not taking your personal financial uh, circumstances into consideration. So the, all the advices that I'm going to provide in this uh, session would be general in nature. And of course, past performance is no guarantee of future performance. So with that out of the way, let's just get started with uh, understanding what stock market actually is. Uh, and I would just try to start off right from the basics, as in why the stock markets exist. Oftentimes when we are so involved, and, and I'm actually speaking to those who are active in stock markets, be as a trader or as an investor, or even as a mutual fund investor, oftentimes we forget what the stock markets actually exist for. And they exist for companies to go and raise capital. So stock market is one of the kinds of capital market, the other one being bonds market. And this might come as a surprise to many, but bond market compared to stock markets is a much, much bigger market. And there's a saying that those who trade in bond markets are usually considered um, smarter people than those who trade in equities, but, but I'll let you decide on that. Uh, However, how are stock markets, uh, how, how stock markets are established and what all are the participants in stock markets? So I would say, uh, first and foremost, what you should look at is, of course, if the stock markets have to go and, uh, if a company has to go and uh, raise capital from its investors, they will have to have a place where they can list themselves. And that would be your stock exchanges. So a company will go to its uh, to a stock exchange and say, I have a working model, I have a profitable business, or I have a business where we believe that the company can do really well and the investors would want to invest. So that's where the investors come in and they give capital to the companies, they become the shareholders. And if the company does well, so does its stock going forward. But of course, you can't uh, you can't just leave all these aspects of a working stock market to the market intermediaries, which could be and the companies, which could also be the brokers. So essentially what you need at the end of the day is a, is a regulator. And if, when you put all of them together, you're looking at an ecosystem of stock markets. Right. So this is what stock markets are for you. Every nation that has an active stock market, uh, you will find that they have a dedicated and neutral regulator. and it it may come as a surprise to many, but you know, regulators actually get paid from all the stock market participants. So brokers, as well as say exchanges, they actually pay to these regulators on a regular basis to regulate them. You may bring up a point of uh, 
conflict of interest here, but that's how things work. Even for a banking regulator, for instance, they get paid from the banks. That's how the system works, but uh, oftentimes we are not taught about these things um, in a classroom when we're taught about uh, you know, the theoretical aspects of stock markets. And exchanges, many people believe that these are government agencies, but they're actually not. However, regulators are always a government agency because believe, again, um, the government is still expected to be, uh, you know, an entity that works for the benefit of the people. So therefore, if a regulator is government owned, you should have more trust on it. If it's not government owned, it's probably not a regulator. All right, so types of investment vehicles that uh, one can consider for investments. Of course, you've got stocks and those are standardized. So one stock will always carry the same value for it. You, you can, nowadays you also have the fractional shares, right? So one of the benefits of listing your stocks on exchange is that you standardize each unit. And then on the other side, you've got mutual fund where the mutual fund manager would invest in multiple stocks at the same time. They will do it for you. And essentially, it's a very, uh, I would say, a very vanilla way of exposing yourself to uh, multiple stocks at the same time. You still get the units. However, uh, ETFs have become quite a rage in the last two, three decades, I'll say. In few countries, it is still a new thing. In other countries, it has become very popular. And they are considered to be somewhat some sort of a bridge between stock and mutual funds because they give you a cost efficient way of investing in a standardized list of securities, which means the ETF floating companies, they only have a little bit of liberty in choosing where they're going to invest. Usually they tell you upfront that this is these are the companies we're going to invest. And the more research they do, the more fees they're going to charge you for that. For example, if you're going to invest in Cathy Woods or ETF, they do a lot of work. They have their own research team and they constantly look for the next investment opportunity. So it's a very active fund and therefore they would charge you a higher fee, just like a mutual fund as well, right? However, if you talk about, let's say, an index fund where, let's say, the index has a set number of stocks, that fund doesn't really have to do any research. They just have to go out and buy those stocks. So they, of course, as a result, cannot charge you a very high research fee. Essentially, they are not doing any research. So as a result, their fee would be really less. And it's a really good way of investing in index funds. You know, if you want to invest in S&P 500, NASDAQ 100, ASX 200, Nifty 50, um, so all these index funds are available at almost negligible fee and they give you exposure at a, even with a very less investment capital as well. Now, you may ask which one is better. There are a lot of aspects that go into deciding which one is best suited for you. However, I would just give you one pointer that will help you decide. And that is how much capital you're planning to invest. Let's say you're going to invest a very small amount of capital. Now, I'm not going to give you a number for that small because small is very subjective. However, if you believe that the capital you're going to invest is small, then it's a good idea to invest in a stock. Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I, I completely said it wrong. It's a good idea to invest the small capital in an ETF. And the reason for that is very simple. ETFs give you the inbuilt diversification right? By investing in an ETF, you're hedging your bets because that ETF would in turn invest in multiple companies. And the chances of all those companies going down at the same time are very, very low as compared to a, a, a single company going down. So essentially, if you have a small capital, the problem that investors often face is that they don't get enough diversification benefits because with smaller capital, they end up getting over-concentrated in only a handful of security. And as a result, they uh, usually end up with more risk than they should in their portfolio. It can go either way as well. Maybe you are over-concentrated in really good stocks. However, more often than not, we know that markets are random and uh, chances of us going wrong generally tend to be on the higher side. And with small capital, it's advisable that you go with ETF.
Okay. Um, one aspect that is often ignored by people is which broker that they should go with. Those of you who probably have absolutely no idea about the stock market intermediaries, let me just quickly uh, cover one aspect of uh, uh, brokerage industry, and that is you can't really go out and buy stocks from an exchange by yourself. It's not like you can open your account with an exchange. An exchange needs an intermediary, and those intermediaries are called stock brokers. I am one of the brokers, but I am comparatively a small broker. If if wanted, if needed, if desired, I can set up my own, uh, let's say, a brokerage system. And as a result, I can also be a full service broker with my own system, access to people and access to stock exchange and connecting them together to be able to buy and sell securities. However, these systems are already enabled by other established brokers, and they are broadly classified into two categories. The first category is a limited service broker. For example, I'm strictly talking about those that are based here in Australia and I have had personal experience with. So Tiger Brokers is one, Stake and Self Wealth. So they offer you access to multiple markets, which is good. I know that a lot of people talk about, let's say, Comsec, um, but I found that they are a little on the higher side. So in my opinion, if you're paying $10 per trade, it's really too much. You can uh, practically hire someone like me to do uh, trading and investing for you if you're paying, paying that much in your buying and selling. They, of course, have to be just sponsored which is, uh, for those of you who are not, not from Australia, um, this is just a custodian that is uh, considered to be a much safer avenue where your stocks can be held once you purchase them. And preferably options trading as well, uh, especially for those who would like to hedge. I'm not saying that you have to be a sophisticated speculator in the market, but if you do understand a tiny bit of derivatives, and if you're someone who's very active in markets, then try to open your account with a broker that gives you these kind of uh, facilities as well. As opposed to these, the other kind of broker is a full service broker. One of the major benefits going with a full service broker is that they give you a lot of research um, publications and as a result you can actually stay updated in the markets and this i believe is only for those who are really active in markets are really market enthusiastic and stay um, you know very close to the recent developments and also want to see what the uh, economists have to say what the market experts have to say so they can subscribe to their services as well and of course their systems come with a lot of bells and whistles a lot of advanced um, ways of trading and investing and using the tools and other data uh, but usually they don't provide you real-time data you have to purchase that and also if you go with these full service brokers, they give you even wider range of markets as well as products. For example, with interactive brokers, this is a broker with whom if you go, you can virtually trade any market in the world. They are pretty much uh, a global, um, inter, uh, global stock broker. And therefore, they may not want to overspend in one country. So they may not be chess sponsored. Interactive brokers, for instance, is not chess sponsored. They work with multiple other custodians, BNP Paribas being one of those, which is one of the GSIBs, one of the uh, biggest banks in the world. And it is, of course, preferable for advanced trader or uh, investors. Now, those of you who probably are already aware about different kinds of brokers and uh, probably this has been just a primer for you however those of you who are still not in stock markets and are looking to open your own account i would highly encourage that you look at least five to ten years ahead before you make your decision you may think that a limited service broker is probably uh, a good bet for you but if you're someone who's planning to be actively trading and investing in future, if you would want exposure to different markets, then it is ideal that you go with full service broker right in the beginning itself. Because once you're tied with the broker, it's not like you can't switch from there, but the efforts involved and the time involved in switching from one to another 
uh, tends to be really consuming. So therefore, I always tell people, do not just go with the easiest option out there. A full service broker might ask for additional uh, items from you, or you might end up paying, let's say, a little bit more than others. However, that's really not the case. I personally work with interactive brokers and they, are, um, they have very competitive pricing. So um, think long term. What is it that you want to do when you're opening your broker account? How many markets you want access to? How many products you want access to? And accordingly, take your decision. If you don't need them today, would you be needing them two years down the line, five years down the line? And then accordingly, take your decision. This is one of the brokers that I work with. They are Tiger Brokers. If you are based out of Australia or even Singapore or US, they are a US listed company, by the way, then you can scan this code. I work with them, so you will get some freebies for joining. Nowadays, they are giving you um, free Tesla and Nvidia stocks if you deposit, say, $2,000 or so in your account. So I thought it's a, it's a really good service and at the same time it's a great opportunity for those who want to get started with their journey to open an account with them the reason i put it here is sometimes when you are really in the thick of things and you're really looking to take action giving you that very piece of information that you need to get started can be very helpful so i thought if i'll just put it in here some of you might take the action right away just because you are right now in that zone trying to learn trying to uh, do something with your finances. All right. Now we're going to get into more technical aspects. So far, I've probably been talking to only those who have absolutely no idea what stock markets are. However, we are now going to dive a little deeper. And I want to talk about the two aspects of analyzing stocks to make your investment decisions. So, of course, the first one is fundamental analysis very very widely used term however not many people understand what fundamental analysis actually entails fundamental analysis is all about finding the right value of a stock however it cannot just be limited to say stocks let's say if i want to find out what is going to be the demand for copper in next year we're talking about a commodity and we know that copper is an, an industrial metal and it has got wide usages and let's say you try to assess what's the current supply in copper and how it would increase or decrease one year down the line and how my demand would increase and decrease down the line and accordingly if you decide whether copper is uh, going to be in higher supply or in lower supply in next one year and accordingly you could take a decision so the point i'm trying to make here is that you can do fundamental analysis on just anything if you think about it even for a stock the only reason it goes up is because there's a lot of demand for that stock the buyers are really enthusiastic they're hitting the offer price as many times as they're getting it and that's how the price is going higher so yes value is what investors look for however at the end of the day it's the demand and supply that makes the markets move that makes the stocks move and you can do fundamental analysis on pretty much any asset people even do it on crypto my license doesn't allow me to do that or to talk about cryptos however uh, those who really look at demand and supply this is what fundamental analysis is all about finding the right value of a stock and when you find value dislocations that's where the opportunities exist not just when a stock is undervalued and you can buy it also when the stock is overvalued and you can short sell it often time people think that fundamental analysis has got nothing to do with short selling however that's really not the case people can do really good fundamental analysis and they can find out stocks that are fundamentally expensive and they can short sell them as well I do conduct uh, another session where I dive deeper into fundamental analysis. However, at this stage, those of you who want something actionable from me, I can quickly switch gears here and maybe talk about a little bit more about fundamental analysis, hoping that this would be useful for uh, at least a few of you.
All right, so what you're looking at right now on the screen is a website called TradingView. It is ideal that you have your own uh, paid account on it. However, even if you have a free account, you can still access a lot of fundamental information here. And the reason I like it is because it is equally suitable for both technical as well as fundamental analysts. People often think of this platform as just a charting software. However, I believe it has a lot more to offer than just simple charting tool. And I personally use it for my own decision making as well. I'm not affiliated with them in any way. However, I believe that this is a good platform to get all information about a stock or any tradable asset at one place. So what you can, what kind of fundamental analysis you can do here? Firstly, any the stock that you might have open, I've got Adobe open here. So let's just talk about it. If most of you are IT people, then you would have heard about this company, or at least you would have used one of their product, which is Adobe Acrobat PDF, right? So here you can actually, if you uh, slide this sidebar, this is where all the information about the company is provided. And in order to see the financial information of the company you can go here and click on more financials and they give you a whole bunch of information here right and as i mentioned fundamental analysis is all about finding what a stock is worth essentially how you calculate that value is you project what kind of cash that company is going to generate in future and then you arrive at what's the present value of all that cash that the company is going to generate in future it's the cash that the company is going to pay out in dividends if it does pay dividend or the cash that it is going to pay out even if it does not pay out that as dividends right so essentially all they care about is what's going to be the net cash the company is going to generate next year the year after the five years down the line and then till perpetuity and you basically calculate the present value of all that cash and that becomes the total market value you divide that total market value with the shares outstanding of the company which you will going to you will find here diluted shares outstanding and then you divide the company's value that you have arrived at with the total shares outstanding 451 million here that's when you get the actual value and based on that you can say whether the stock is undervalued or overvalued if you if you found it too complicated worry not reach out to me separately i can teach you or i can organize another session just let us know let us uh, either let suchindra know or i'll leave my own contact coordinates as well but a little primer on the kind of information that you can get over here let's say you're looking to buy a stock and you've got absolutely no idea how to look at uh, financial statements there are three kind of financial statements income balance and cash flow however the least you would know is that there is something called revenue that the company generates so when you're going to buy a company at least come here and here it gives you option whether you want to look at the data annually or quarterly i would say go look at the data annually because quarterly can have some seasonal aspects as well you know during christmas for example a manufacturing company may sell more products because their products could be used for gifts right so you want to actually see the data on an annual basis if you're doing uh, this kind of an analysis, which is very cursory in nature. You're not doing any data crunching at all. And you want to see how the company's growth has been when it comes to its revenues. And here you can see that by and large, the company has been growing by 10 to 20%. Uh, its revenues have been growing by this measure. And here there is this expectation that they may exceed $20 billion for the next year. And then you look at the gross profit, right? which should ideally also be increasing at the same pace so this is the bare minimum that you can do and a few other pieces of information that you can look at is you go here on cash flow and uh, make sure that cash from operating activities is always positive and rising essentially as i mentioned earlier it's all about the cash that the company generates. Everything else is just noise. So you do want the cash from operating activities to firstly be positive. You will not find this for many companies, right? And at the same time, look at the free cash flow, right? 
because this is what goes into calculating the value of the company free cash flow so free cash flow is the number which you would compute year on year basis and then bring that value to its present value and then derive the value of the company you can also go look at some of the other data points related to total assets and liabilities however there are some other pieces of information that i would also want you to look at so go here on statistics and here you're going to find all the ratios that are derived from uh, one or the other of these three um, statements right so the data from these statements is presented in ratio form for people to understand uh, performance of a company in a slightly better way and there are dozens and dozens of ratios i mean if you flip a ratio then you get another new ratio right so i've got price to earnings if i do earnings to price that will be another ratio for me okay and by the way you can look at pe ratios but I've got a whole video on it. If you'll go and check out my PE ratio video on YouTube, you'll find more information about how you can use it. Um, what I would want you to always look at for a company is, is debt to assets ratio, right? It's very, very important. And you want this to be on the lower side. If it is exceeding one, one and a half, then that can be a red flag. However, the company's business also matters. Maybe it is capital intensive business and the company is at its initial stages, which means it's okay for a company to have tiny bit of assets. So you have to always do that apple to apple comparison, but always make sure that if you're buying a company, uh, it shouldn't have too much debt. A two, three in ratio of debt to assets can be really too much. So these are some of the other aspects that um, you can look at a company. And a thumb rule, I'll just quickly go back and uh, show you one thing. Even if you're only looking at, let's say, gross profits, and if they're rising consistently, that's a very good sign that the company is doing really well. While we are at it, why not talk about NVIDIA as well? And let's see if the growth in the company is justified by the numbers that it has been producing in the last few years. And believe me, you will be surprised at the kind of growth this company has shown. If you are an employee somewhere, you would love to have this kind of a growth in your salary as well. So this was the company, and I'm switching to annual here. In 2017, NVIDIA's revenue was only $9.7 billion. And we're only talking about just seven years ago. Right now, the company is projecting $80 billion. So we're talking about the nine times rise in its revenue. However, what's most surprising here is not the revenue increase, but the gross profit increase from 5.84 to $60 billion, right? So this is the kind of growth that we're talking about. And that's why these kind of numbers, they are unprecedented. You haven't seen these kind of growth. And this is a monthly chart that I'm showing you. Look at the kind of uh, progress that this stock has shown, which is, completely timed with its fundamentals. So you don't have to be an expert just to find out how the company is operating. And this is exactly what I'm trying to tell you people here. Just look at some of the financials and see if the stock growth is comparable to the growth in their numbers as well. So look at total revenue, look at the gross profit, go to cash flows, see how the free cash flow has been increasing 2.91 to 39 billion dollars that's like 13 times growth um, and it's unprecedented you don't see many companies like this this is one one in a let's say decade or two kind of a company we we saw something like this with amazon and apple about 5 10 years ago all right so i've spoken enough about uh, fundamental analysis i believe that you got uh, something out of it but let me know if you have any questions on that. Now, technical analysis. Anything that's not fundamental analysis, I believe that it is technical analysis. Technical analysis is slightly different kind of data crunching. It's still data analysis, but it puts a lot of, I would say, weightage to something called uh, the stock price, the patterns, the trading volumes, the market indicators and stuff. So, so now you may ask, what about the, let's say, the, the quant-based trading and investing decisions that people make? What are those? Well, that is also technical analysis because they're crunching number. If you're not 
deciding the value of a company by using fundamental analysis, whatever else you're doing, it's always going to be technical analysis. All right. I don't want to go too deep into it. Uh, however, know that there is no way to tell that one kind is better than other. All that matters at the end of the day is what is it that you believe in? What is it that you know better? And what is it that gives you better return going forward? I have met people who have made a lot of money on fundamental analysis, really good at them. Some of them work with me in my, com my own company. And then I personally have made a lot of money from technical analysis. And I use a mix of both and it has rewarded me really well. So there is really no way to say that one is better than the other one. However, people may have their own preferences as well. All right, here I want to dive a little deeper into investment approaches, and I want to specifically talk about active versus passive investing. And this is a very common topic, and often people misunderstand what active investing is and what passive investing is. There are benefits, firstly, of being a passive investor. Often when you are a passive investor, you ride through the bull and the bear market phases and ultimately you come on top. However, if you're an active investor, what happens is oftentimes you panic when the markets are going down. When the markets print their bottom, you often don't realize that this is the bottom. And as a result, you miss the rally where the markets surpass the levels when you sold and you end up buying at a much higher level. So the point I'm trying to make here is that more often than not, passive investing rewards investors really well, unless you are a really good active investor. I'm not saying that it's difficult. However, there are a lot of aspects associated to active versus passive investing, or at least you should know what passive investing is in true sense. Sometimes people do something that is actually active invested, active investing. However, they may think that what they're doing is passive. Now, this is not my study. This is from Dalbar, and they they do some really great studies. I've come across many presentations in many conferences where people actually refer to a lot of studies from them. So I'd highly recommend that you go out and check the kind of work that they do. This is one of my favorite studies that they did where they assessed uh, the investment of $1 million that someone might have done at the end of year 1996. And they would have done it in US equities, which is the S&P 500, or they may have done it in bonds. And what they've compared is, firstly, if you see this dark green bar with this dark blue bar, they've seen that this thing that US equities have much better performed as compared to investing in, say, US bonds. So if you would have invested a million dollar at the end of year 1996, those would only be $3 million worth. But if you had invested the same amount at the end of the year 2021, you would be sitting at $10 million. I believe right now this amount should be even, even higher because uh, the markets have been doing really well and they have surpassed the levels seen in 2021. So maybe this number should be at least 10 to 20% higher from there. However, they've also said that based on an average equity fund investor's performance, where they try to time the markets and are very actively buying and selling, they would most likely be only sitting at $6 million. And of course, they have made some assumptions here while profiling an average equity fund investor. And at the same time, if they look at the performance of an average bond fund investor who has been taking the decisions actively, they would have underperformed even badly here. So this is a study that talks about the benefits of being a passive investor. However, it's easier said than done because of a chart like this. Here, what you're seeing is drawdowns that a person sees in one year. And this data goes back to 1928 till 2019. So unfortunately, we haven't covered here the 2020 crash. but it tells you on average 
the stocks drop about 16.3 percent per year so every year you can expect the markets to drop by this much percentage so it's not for weak hearted you should in a way expect some kind of a crash in markets all the times if a market has dropped by 10 percent it's considered correction if the market is down by 20 percent it's called officially a bear market so recently when nasdaq 100 those of you who track markets nasdaq 100 did drop by 10 percent that was officially tagged as a correction in nasdaq 100 and this is something we're talking about s p 500 that is a mix of 500 stocks right at times stocks drop by 50 percent and people don't even talk about them and here we're talking about index so it's not that easy and then you get periods like 1931 like 2008 and 2020 i can show you the 2020 data as well where the maximum drawn down was 34 percent as you can see over here so <laughs> pardon me so what's the benefit of staying invested let me just show you how this table here is structured starting again from 1928 it says that maximum drawdown in year 1928 was 10%. That's how much the index at one point dropped. However, the total return on the index was 43.8%. So within one year, the return was 43.8%. But if someone would have panicked here when the markets were down 10%, you, they would have missed out on this 43.8% rally. So this graph, or this table is a perfect example to show you how you should never panic in the markets. Again, we had those of you who know about the uh, macro, uh, the major macro instances in the world, in US, and even worldwide, we saw um, the Great Depression. And the slowdown was at that time experienced uh, across the globe. You should go out and read about it. So, Yes, the markets were weak, but then there were instances when the markets dropped by 20, 30 percent, but then the returns were absolutely amazing towards the end of the year. And you and this is not just recent. Even here, you will see one of the greatest bull markets that we are seeing um, after the World War II, in fact, is right here. You can see that the stocks do drop 5 percent, 9 percent, but the S&P 500 recovers. By the way, a fun fact. S&P 500 actually was created back in the year 1947. So these numbers that you're seeing, they're actually extrapolated backwards by the company, right? So S&P 500 was not in existence before 1947. All right, so this is how you, if you take a snapshot of something like this, every time the markets are dropping, take a look at this. This will remind you that staying invested in markets will reward you in a long term. And you don't have to listen to an analyst. You don't have to read the news who are usually trying to scare you and push you out of your stock holdings. Just look at something like this and it'll calm your nerves when you need them the most. All right. So is passive investing the way to go? I'm, I'm actually not claiming that. You do need... Uh, now, this is... A sort of a moral aspect of investing. It has got nothing to do with me trying to teach you. I just want to bring um, a, a point related to ethics, a point related to morals as well. Let's say we are all becoming a uh, passive investor uh, slowly, and, and there comes a time in future when there are no active investors left in the market. So what would happen is, because you can't just buy an index, you'll have to buy through the ETF providers, right? So you can go with BlackRock, Vanguard. So Vanguard is um, was started by Jack Bogle, who is also considered the father of in index investing. He's the one who came up with this idea, by the way. Uh, and BlackRock and Vanguard are two of the biggest firms. And then these are the other three, and these are the top five ETF creators. They let you passively invest in most of the asset classes across the globe. And so when you see the institutional holdings of any stock, you often find that you see BlackRock owns 6.7%, Vanguard owns this much percentage. And there's there are there's a lot of misinformation that floats around in markets where I say, look, BlackRock, how big it is, it owns 6.7% of something called Apple and 7.1% of something called Meta, right? Uh, now, these are one of the some of the biggest companies we're talking about. If BlackRock owns this much and uh, 
then shouldn't BlackRock in turn become one of the biggest companies? Because the misinformation that floats around in uh, social media is that, look, these companies own so much of these companies, uh, which are so big. Uh, and they are so big and they're taking a pie and whatnot and they essentially control the world. No, that's not the case. They're just investing on your behalf. It's not BlackRock's investment. It's not Vanguard's investment in these um, companies. It's the investment they've done on behalf of their passive investors, right? So um, always um, try to look under the hood and um, try to assess whether the information is right or not. If so were the case, as I said, BlackRock should have been one of the biggest companies. However, it's not. It's probably not even in top 10, if I'm not mistaken. So what happens if everyone becomes a passive investor? Any decision that Mark Zuckerberg wants to take related to Meta, nobody will be able to stop him. Why? Because passive investors don't care. BlackRock doesn't care what Meta is doing. BlackRock simply takes your money and invests in the company on your behalf. So you do need active investors in this world. There should always be who can steer the company in the right direction. You call them activist investor. You can call them whatever you want to call them. However, we do need these active investors, right? So this is just, um, I would say, and, and the ethics side of uh, passive investing that we should all be aware of. So those of you um, who don't know, Zuckerberg still owns about 13 and a half percentage of the company. That makes him still the biggest owner of the company. And if he wants to basically take any decision, he can still take that unilaterally. However, if you do have a few active investors invested in Meta, they can steer the company into different directions if they think that Zuckerberg is not doing something that is not in the interest of let's say the greater good all right so now getting a little personal here let me just share my active investment style i am basically what i follow is uh, uh, in in our world it's called a satellite approach where at the center is the passive investing that i do so for example every time the index drops by five ten percent i look to buy index funds so that's at the center of my investing however i also do active investing where i very selectively pick stocks and i try to beat the index by picking those stocks there's very very limited number of stocks i purchase but i purchase in very big quantity and my um I, I would say rules to invest in stocks is that the stock should have very high momentum and it should be outperforming its peers, the sector and the benchmark. So let's say you um, bring a, a stock that is not, not a very common one that anyone would want to buy. Let's say you bring Wells Fargo Bank and you ask me, do I want to invest in this bank? I will see how the Wells Fargo Bank is doing as compared to its peers, the other banks. How is it doing as compared to uh, all the banks in the US, not just its peers? When I say its peers, it's the large banks in US, the top five, the top 10 stock uh, uh, banks. But when I say sector, I'll talk about the entire financial sector. How do you, um, how, what's the difference between sector and industry? Something you're going to learn today if you didn't know already. A sector is a combination of different industries for example energy is a sector but within energy you can have oil you can have gas you can have coal um, you can also have renewable energy sources so they all are different industries and when you put them all together that becomes one sector so for me i would compare how wells fargo is doing against his peers the big banks i'll compare how it's doing within the financial sector including both banking as well as other financial companies, including insurance. And I would also compare how it's doing vis-a-vis -vis the benchmark, the S&P 500, the Dow Jones index, and so on. And if it is outperforming all of these, I would consider buying it. However, uh, specifically about mm, Wells Fargo, I don't think it will qualify if I were to buy. All right. So this is an approach I follow and I really enjoy. Sometimes I end up buying stocks that nobody is talking about, and all of a sudden it becomes a market darling. Uh, and, I, and I like to be in a situation where 
all of a sudden I see someone talking about it in the news and I know that I'm invested in it already and that my system brought that stock to me and I ended up buying it. But it's it's a win and lose game. Sometimes you win, um, sometimes you lose, sometimes you realize that you were looking to buy it, but it did not really qualify all the criteria and then it went up. So, you know, uh, there you have to be uh, willing to uh, you know go through these kind of ups and downs in markets you, uh, the regrets are just part of staying active in markets trading versus investing uh, this is the last topic that i want to cover and you can essentially talk about it all day however i only have a few pointers that i want to share with you for me trading is a systematic business i'm someone who does both trading as well as investing and before I became a broker, I used to do it full time. So I literally used to trade for a living. But if you're a beginner, I would say treat it just as a side hustle, just something that you want to learn, maybe invest in a few books or in a few courses and learn first. If you're in a job, you're, you're probably not even going to invest, say, 1% of your total earning. You can learn from someone, but treat it as a proper side hustle business, because in my opinion, uh, at the end of the day, the trading returns don't really depend on whether you're a full-time trader or not. They are directly tied with, firstly, of course, how good you are, and secondly, how much of a capital you're trading with. So you can be a completely part-time trader, and you can still make very good money. And I'm saying this from my own personal experience, where when I was in a job, consistently for a long period of time, I used to earn way more than my job. And I did all that while being... Uh, in a full-time job and not being able to track market all day. And trading can be both short and long term. It, people often think that trading means you're sitting in front of computer all day. I never sit in front of computer all day. In fact, I'm not that kind of person who can do it. Uh, but people think that you uh, trading means sitting in a coffee shop or maybe having four or five screens in front of you and then trading or uh, you know, when you start trading for a living, you can go sit on a beach and do trading. So that's the that's the ideal aspect that often lures a lot of people. Uh, however, it doesn't mean that this is the only way you can trade. You can just decide slowly, steadily. Uh, think about out of five stocks, which is the one that you want to buy and do all the analysis, right? At your own pace and then ultimately decide. It doesn't matter if the stock you're buying is at 60 or 62. If it's going to 100, you will still make a lot of money. So you never rush. You take a very uh, calm and composed decision. You'll never be in a rush. That's not trading. That That's like hustling yourself. And you never want to do that when you're dealing with serious money. Investing is, uh, I would say, people often misinterpret investing. If you are doing active investing, if someone says, hey, go buy uh, that stock because I think it's going to go up, that is not investing, that's trading. And also at the same time, if you're trying to time the markets, I believe, right? then that becomes active investing. So if all of a sudden you are selling off all the banks and you're looking to buy all the IT companies, that is active investing. That is not passive, but that can be an active investing. With investing, you should always associate a time horizon, right? That you are going to be invested for two years, three years, right? And that means you don't allow yourself to be bothered with the day-to-day -day volatility. So in my opinion, passive investing in true sense means investing in country index funds, be it S&P 500, Nifty 50, ASX 200, DAX 40, FTSE 100, right? So if you're investing those, I believe that's your true meaning of passive investing. Now you can ask a question here. What if I, let's say, invest $100 every month in Apple? You can call that a passive investing, but there is an element of active investing in this. And that is you chose to bet on Apple as a company here. So there is an element of active investing. But if you're a disciplined investor and slowly accumulating good, high quality blue chip companies, there's nothing wrong with that. You will be rewarded really well. In fact, there was a study done where they said, if you just buy top 10 highest weightage stocks in an index fund you've got really good chances to beat that index so if you invest in let's say let's take an example of nifty 50 i mean i don't know how many of you are exposed to indian markets but if you just pick 
top 10 stocks of Nifty 50 and only buy in those, buy those stocks, there's a really good chance that you will make really good money because you're buying the 10 top companies of a growing economy. And the best part, if an ETF investor is putting in the money, because these 10 stocks have got the highest weightage, most of their money will go into these 10 stocks anyway. And all you have to do is keep tracking which those 10 stocks are. If that ranking changes, you sell off the one that is no longer a top 10 stock and buy the one that has now become a list of the top 10 stocks. So there you go. That's one of the systematic ways you can approach investing. And you don't need me, you don't need anyone else to tell you that you are picking the top 10 companies, right? And of course, you are picking the top biggest companies as well, because that's the nature of um, the ETF setup in, especially when it comes to Nifty 50, that's how it is built. And that's why investing only rewards patient investors. Uh, oftentimes we become forced investors. We bought something, the stock dropped, and as a result, um, we become investors in it. Um, you shouldn't do that. If you're becoming an investor, become an investor, have a longer term horizon, okay? So this is all that I wanted to cover. Before you all go, I just quickly wanted to I uh, also share something that I am going to do. Um, and that is about a live coaching program that I will kick off on 1st of September. And in that live coaching program, those who would enroll in this, I will give them hands on practical learning using technical analysis, how you can do both trading as well as investing. So I would assume that all the attendees are coming in from um, really ground zero, have absolutely no understanding of stock markets or technical analysis. So we'll start off with introduction, then we'll talk about a few swing trading setups, which I believe are perfectly suited for beginners. And then we'll talk about some price reversal strategies and then chart patterns. You must have come across those, those terms like double bottom, double top, head and shoulders and so on. But you know, 70 to 90 percent of those patterns don't work but i'll cover the patterns that actually work and i believe that investors or traders should look for them or at least if you're someone who's active in markets i don't care whether you're a trader or investor if you're looking for the right entry points there's no better way than being able to identify the chart patterns and then taking your entry as well as exit decisions then my favorite topic multi-bagger investing where i will i will be covering um each and every decision-making aspect related to portfolio building. I'll be covering my entire system that I use for identifying the stocks that I should be building. How do I build my portfolio? How I rebalance them going forward and so on. And then of course, for those who are really active or are looking to become full-time traders in future, and are very much interested in intraday trading, I'll talk about that as well. And the last module will be options trading. It'll all be live. I'll be talking to each one of you in person and you will have the opportunity to not only ask the questions then and there, but also try and implement what you learned during the week come back next week and ask me the questions once again. It will be all held on a Sunday, right? So <clears throat> it will go on for three months, starting from 1st of September. And the reason I'm doing it live is because I don't want this to be transactional where you learn something from me, whether it worked or not for you, I don't care, I get paid either way. No, I want to make sure that if you become a part of it, then I stay invested in your success so if you're really interested in joining this program then you can scan this code here and make the payment and then you can join in if you have any questions about this program or in general as well if you want to know anything or if you want to just connect with me then you can send an email to info at sanjeevkaushik.com one of my teammates would schedule a uh, some time within, in our calendars and we should be able to uh, talk <clears throat> after that. Thank you all for joining in the session. I really appreciate you all giving us this precious time of yours, especially at the dinner time for a few and maybe office time for others. Really appreciate. And yeah, feel free to stay connected. I look forward to uh, meeting some of you 
in person or online. And once again, Suchindra, thanks a lot for giving me the opportunity to yep. present in front of this wonderful crowd. Yep.